appropriately enough, I need to start this evening with a very small correction. If any of you read about this event on the RSA website, then you are under the impression that you are here tonight to hear a talk by the American writer and humorist Katherine Schultz. That's half right, but unfortunately it's the wrong half. <laughs> uh, I am in fact a writer, but I am sorry to report that I am not actually a humorist. Although I'm thrilled <laughs> that somebody at the RSA <laughs> found my book sufficiently funny <laughs> that they would describe me that way. And I will use it as a reminder to myself not to bore you to death tonight if I possibly can avoid it. And in a sense, it's kind of an appropriate mistake, aside from the fact that it just is a mistake, because uh, it is true that mistakes can sometimes be quite funny, especially when they happen to other people. And it is also true that mistakes can sometimes be quite useful. And I actually found this particular mistake when I noticed it on the RSA website to be useful because it made me think, you know, maybe I should talk a little bit about wrongness and humor tonight. So I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to do it until the very end of this talk. And we're going to take a very long and winding, well, not that long. <laughs> we're going to take a very winding road to get there. And that is actually also quite appropriate. Um, as some of you probably know, the word error comes from a Latin root that actually means to wander, to roam, to go astray, if you will. So we're going to have a little bit of a wandering journey tonight. I will thank you in advance for your patience in joining me on it. And lest you worry that wandering is the same thing as aimless, I will give you a sense of our overall destination. And this too I owe to the RSA. For those of you who are associated with it or who have been to other events, you might know that the RSA has this new theme they're promoting, which is the idea of a 21st century enlightenment. So one of the things that I hope to do in my talk tonight is actually to challenge your idea of what an enlightenment is and what it means to be enlightened. So that's where we're going on our wandering journey. And our first stop on it is going to be at my own personal id. <laughs> it's not quite as scary as it sounds. I just want to tell you about a dream that I had recently. Uh, this was earlier this year, back in March or April. So it was before the British version of the book came out, and in fact, before the American version of the book came out. And therefore, of course, before any reviews of the book had come out. But in my dream, I was reading a review of my own book in the New York Times. And it was the most withering, <laughs> scathing, terrible review you can possibly imagine. I mean, it really was the kind of review that could only possibly be generated by the mind of a really rather nervous first-time author. <laughs> and the first line of this imaginary review, which I remember verbatim because I woke up and I immediately wrote it down, the first line was, in being wrong, adventures in the margin of error, Catherine Schultz has managed to unite a difficult and whiny tone <laughs> with a subject matter everybody despises. <laughs> right. <laughs> so why am I telling you this? I can actually see my lovely publicist sitting here wondering that herself. She's like, Catherine, we want people to read your book. <laughs> Forget for a moment about the difficult and whiny tone. You guys can be the judge of that. But I do want to talk a little bit tonight about the ostensibly despicable subject matter of my book. Uh, a couple of months after this dream, the real New York Times review came out. It was thankfully much kinder to me. But the reviewer, uh, interestingly, decided to compare me to an entomologist. <laughs> he said, in essence, you know, most people in that field would go out and study dolphins, or butterflies, or the rainforest. Catherine Schultz is like the naturalist who chooses to spend her time and energy and talents studying cockroaches. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that is actually a great description of how most of us feel about mistakes. As with cockroaches, 
we generally don't really think about mistakes unless they are right in front of us. <laughs> unless it's actually kind of crawling up our literal or figurative walls, we really don't like to spend any of our time thinking about the experience of being wrong. We also, when we do bother to think about mistakes, we tend to think of them as sort of the most irritating and disgusting and unwelcome inhabitants of the intellectual kingdom. They are our cognitive cockroaches. That attitude toward error is the one that I set out to understand when I wrote this book. Specifically, I set out to try to understand the origins of that attitude toward error and its consequences. And finally, to propose a different way of thinking about being wrong that might ultimately be more helpful and healthy and productive for all of us. So in extremely condensed form, that is what I'm going to try to do with and for you guys tonight. And I want to start by telling you a story. It's a story about a woman who I'm going to call Hannah. It takes place in the early 1990s in Austria. And Hannah is having a an appointment with a neurologist by the name of Georg Goldenberg. The doctor walks into the appointment and he starts things off with a kind of strange question. He says, excuse me, Hannah, but would you mind just to begin describing my own face for me? This is kind of a weird question, but Hannah is a patient kind of patient, and so she says, okay, you've got Short brown hair, no glasses, no beard. You look like you've got a little bit of a tan. The doctor says, great. And, and could you just describe this object on the table in front of us? She says, OK. It's a notebook, like the kind I used to use in elementary school. And uh, there's something written on the front, but it's facing away from me, and it's written in a script. I can't quite tell what it says. The doctor says, OK, great. And can you tell me, if you don't mind, just exactly where that notebook is right now? Hannah says, sure. You're holding it up in your left hand at just about my eye level. So here's the trouble. Throughout this entire conversation, Dr. Goldenberg's face was hidden behind a black screen. The object on the table in front of him was, in fact, a hairbrush. And when he asked Hannah about its whereabouts, he had taken it and set it underneath his seat. It turns out that Hannah was blind. A couple of weeks before this doctor's appointment, she had suffered a massive stroke. It had paralyzed her entire left side of her body, and it had completely destroyed her visual cortex. Some of you might know these are actually not uncommon side effects of strokes. But Hannah was also suffering from a much more uncommon and far stranger side effect of her stroke, which is that although she was completely blind, she had no idea of it. She was under the impression that she could see. This incredibly rare condition, an incredibly strange condition, is called Anton syndrome. And it is part of a group of equally odd syndromes that are collectively known as anosognosia. The word means denial or lack of knowledge of a disease. The uh, slightly more common but definitely equally strange version of anosognosia is the condition of being paralyzed and being unaware that you are paralyzed. Strangely, this is much more common than you would think. People who suffer from strokes and are left with one side of their body incapable of moving will, more often than you would ever guess, do strange things like invite you out for a round of golf or off for a little stroll down to the local coffee shop. They cannot move and they don't know it. They think incorrectly, of course, that they can. I'm telling you the story of Blind Hannah because it illustrates three crucially important points about wrongness. For starters, it helps establish for us what you might call the outer limit of being wrong. Or more precisely, it helps establish that there actually is no outer limit of being wrong. 
It's quite challenging when you think about it to imagine anything you are more sure of than whether or not you can see or whether or not you can move. I'm really not standing up here right now entertaining any doubts whatsoever about whether I can see you guys or whether I am in fact free and able to pace up and down this area. We really don't entertain doubts about our own physical being. But what the story of blind Hannah shows us is that there is almost no belief we can have about the world that cannot, under certain circumstances, fail us. So this is the first important point about this story. It's, in a sense, a point about humility. It's a point about the ever-present possibility of getting it wrong. The second thing that we can learn from Blind Hannah is a way of understanding what exactly it means to be wrong, what we mean when we talk about wrongness. Here's what neurologists think is happening for people with Anton syndrome and denial of paralysis and other forms of anosognosia. They think that absent the normal sources of information about the world because the brain has been damaged and can't access them, our brains misinterpret an image that we have inside our own minds for something that is actually going on in the world. So we remember the sensation of moving, and we think that that memory is something that's actually transpiring in real life. Or we remember a doctor we once had who was clean shaven and had short brown hair and a lovely tan because he'd just gotten back from vacation like doctors are wont to do. And we think that's happening in the real world. This is actually a very useful way of understanding wrongness. When we are wrong, we are mistaking our own personal representation of the world for something that is actually happening out there outside of us. And what wrongness reminds us of, for better and for worse, is that there is a gap between our mind and the world, that what's happening inside our own heads is not necessarily and always the same thing as what's happening in the world. For all kinds of emotional reasons, we're often sort of resistant to the fact that that gap even exists. We'd like to just be in perfect sympathy and accord with the world, but alas, we are not, and wrongness reminds us of that. So that's the second lesson that we can learn from blind Hannah. The third thing that we learn from this story is a metaphor for the experience of being wrong. To be blind to our own blindness is the condition of all of us when we're mistaken about something. Think to yourselves just for a moment. What does it feel like to be wrong? The answer to this question is that it doesn't feel like anything. It feels like a lot of things to realize that you're wrong, right? It can feel confusing or upsetting or embarrassing or exciting or interesting or revelatory to realize that you're wrong. But to simply be wrong, to be sort of wandering through life, holding on to a belief that somewhere down the line you are going to conclude is erroneous, necessarily feels like absolutely nothing. When I was a little kid, I grew up in this fairly bookish household. I'm sure you can't tell. <laughs> but I liked to watch Saturday morning cartoons when I was a kid. And in particular, I liked to watch the Looney Tunes. And in particular, particular, I liked to watch this one cartoon about this poor, hopeless coyote who was always chasing a roadrunner. Are you guys with me? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, OK, great. So in pretty much every episode of this cartoon, there comes a moment when the roadrunner runs off a cliff, which is fine because a roadrunner is a bird. It can fly. And the coyote follows the roadrunner off the cliff. And what's amazing is he just keeps right on running. And he's fine up until the moment that he looks down and realizes that he's run off a cliff. And at that point, he plummets. This, I think, is an excellent metaphor for the experience of being wrong. Like the roadrunner, when we are wrong but have not yet realized it, we're already in trouble when we think we're on solid ground. So I should actually correct myself a little bit. It does feel like something to be wrong. It feels exactly like being right. And that, of course, is the troubling thing about it. So these are the three lessons we learn from Lion Hammer. We learn that it is possible to be wrong about almost anything and almost everything. We learn that our errors 
stem from this persistent gap between our own minds and the rest of the world. And we learn that while we are wrong, there is no way of sensing or knowing it. You might be wondering what this has to do with the Enlightenment. <laughs> if you will, reflect for a moment on how we think and talk about the Enlightenment. For starters, we say enlightenment. We talk about illumination. We talk about the end of the dark ages. We talk about the light of knowledge gradually spreading across Western Europe. I think this idea of illumination is exactly wrong. I think the fundamental condition of being enlightened is acceptance of the fact that we are deeply in the dark. And this shift in metaphors from an idea of lightness to an acceptance and embrace of darkness is important because it helps us understand how we would go about having a new enlightenment if, like the RSA and like many thoughtful people, we think that would be nice. <laughs> It suggests, for starters, that championing the light of a certain knowledge might not be the best route. It's really tempting to think, I have enlightened beliefs, and please, will everyone just follow and share my enlightened beliefs? I just want to spread my own knowledge. I'm incredibly sympathetic to this impulse because I feel it in myself all the time. But I don't actually think it's conducive to a culture of enlightenment. I think that the real way to spread that kind of culture is not to try to get everyone to cluster around your own particular set of ostensible knowledge, but is instead to accept this idea of the possibility of wrongness, to accept the ways that we're in the dark, and to insist on a space at the table for uncertainty and ambiguity and error. And the original Enlightenment thinkers absolutely understood this. Montaigne famously inscribed above the, the door to his office, que je? what do I know? And Descartes, of course, famously doubted absolutely everything it is humanly possible to doubt and some things that I thought it wasn't, including, of course, his own existence. Which is actually quite a lot as if blind Hannah, while sitting there in her doctor's office, bombarded by his strange questions, had stepped back and said, maybe I actually can't see you. Descartes was committed to a doubt that profound and that all-encompassing. And I think that kind of doubt is the way forward into what we might think of as an enlightenment. I think we all need to start asking ourselves, what do I know? And I think we need to start asking ourselves what I think of as actually one of the most important, if also one of the most challenging questions in life, which is, what if I'm wrong? And the good news about this is that it's not nearly as gloomy a project as it might at first blush sound, because remember, I do not happen to think that mistakes are like cockroaches. I actually think that the project of wondering if we're wrong can be a very exciting one. And the original Enlightenment thinkers also understood this. The great minds of the scientific revolution, for instance, were incredibly excited about error. They understood that it was only when belief systems collapsed, when things did not go as planned, that that was when things got interesting. That was when you learned the most. That was when you had a chance to completely reconstruct your worldview Somewhat for the better, not perfectly. They knew that perfection was beyond them, but for the better. And interestingly, the creative minds of the Enlightenment, and in fact the creative minds of every era, have also understood the centrality of doubt and error to their own work. One of my favorite formulations of this, and, and one of the most famous ones, comes from the poet John Keats, who once sent a letter to his brother in which he said, I have finally figured out what characteristic it is that creative geniuses all possess. And he named this characteristic negative capability, the capacity to dwell for great periods of time 
in doubt. So the great scientific and the great creative minds of pretty much every era have welcomed and accepted doubt and error into their lives. And they've done this in two ways. I think there's a, there's a kind of practical level to this acceptance of doubt, and there's a philosophical level. The practical level is probably more immediately self-evident to you. Uh, James Joyce once described mistakes as the portals of discovery. Anyone who's ever written a book <laughs> knows that you burn through a lot of very bad drafts before you get a good book. Anyone who's ever conducted a scientific experiment knows that the vast majority of them fail. And that every once in a while it actually is the failure that leads to the great insight and the great new idea. So on a surely practical level, mistakes are very often the engine of innovation and change and advancement. But there is, as I said, also a philosophical relationship between science and the creative arts and error. I said to you earlier that error arises from this gap between the world as we represent it in our mind and the world as it might or might not be on its own terms. And in that sense, you can almost think of science and the arts as a form of mistakes. Scientific theories are an effort also to bridge that gap. They are our minds doing their best to make sense of the world. The stories that we tell, whether it is Shakespeare or Harry Potter, these are also our minds doing their best to represent the world. Error and imagination and the intellect, these are all very close kin. And not just imagination, the arts and sciences, but also, I would say, comedy. I promised you at the very beginning of this talk that I was going to eventually work my way around to talking a little bit about wrongness and humor, and the moment is upon us. Comedy also, very often, springs from this same, oftentimes troubling to us, gap between what we think is going on in our heads and what's actually going on in the world. This is not just my own made-up idea about wrongness. It's a very, very famous theory of comedy. It's called the incongruity theory. It's been around for a very long time. Aristotle subscribed to it, and we don't even think he was the first. So that says something about the durability of this theory of comedy. Incongruity theory of comedy basically says, we laugh when we think that one thing is going to happen, and then something else entirely transpires. If that sounds unlikely, I will give you a very quick example. Groucho Marx, who actually was a famous American humorist, once kissed the hand of an elderly female acquaintance after a dinner party and said to her, I have had a perfectly lovely evening. But this wasn't it. <laughs> so why are you laughing? You're laughing because you thought one thing was going on, and then it turned out that something very different was going on. You thought a lovely compliment was being paid, and actually a rather scathing insult resulted. This condition of thinking that one thing is going on, only to find out that actually something entirely different happens, is the essence of being wrong. Sometimes it is really upsetting. Sometimes it is confusing. Sometimes it is even catastrophic. Sometimes it is funny. And sometimes it is pleasurable. And sometimes it is revelatory. But whatever it is, it is with us to stay. We are not going to get rid of our errors. And so I would say to you that the truly enlightened condition is the one in which we accept and embrace the enduring fact that the world is mysterious and confusing, and changeable, and startling. And that the state of being enlightened is actually a state of accepting that obscurity. I would also say to you that I have had a perfectly wonderful evening. <laughs> <laughs> and this was it. <laughs> and I hope you have as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Catherine, thanks so much. That was terrific.
My pleasure. Absolutely terrific. Um, as I said at the beginning, we'll have a, uh, a chat up here, not a private chat. You're welcome to listen to that. And then we'll, uh, we'll open it out for some questions until about seven. And then Catherine's very kindly agreed to sign copies of her book, which will be available outside afterwards as well. Um, I read your book and I loved it. There was one question throughout that I had in my mind. And it's a glass half full versus glass half empty kind of question. Mm -hmm. Or to put it in very simple terms, should I walk away from that book feeling good or bad? Okay, and I, <laughs> and I, well, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, okay, I don't know. I, I'm afraid of being uh, right about this, uh, I guess. Um, and the question for me is this. You know, on the one hand, I, you know, I can listen to you and read your book and I think, okay, uh, doubt and uncertainty and being wrong and error are great things because they're the source of curiosity and further exploration and creativity and all of those good things that we'd all celebrate according to our kind of uh, liberal values. So that's great. But on the you're other making hand... making me nervous, Robert. <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, I sort of think you're saying, this is terrible. We live in a state of never complete enlightenment, it's never light enough, we're always in a state of partial darkness, even though more things can come out of that, but fundamentally, we're always behind and playing catch-up in some sense, and to put it in very grand terms, you know, we are fallen creatures, we are wrong pretty much all of the time, and the things we think we're right about are often a, a matter of just assertion or dogma or, um, or just denial in some form. So I guess I found myself kind of walking that tightrope between <laughs> optimism and pessimism, and maybe you're on the tightrope too, but I'd be interested to hear. I think, it's a, I think it's a great question and a lovely thought. I suppose I do come down on the optimistic side. Yeah. Um, I'm not terribly dismayed by the knowledge that uh, we are likely wrong about a lot of things all the time and, and probably wrong about some very large things. Um, in part, I'm not dismayed because I'm a fairly pragmatic person, and I don't see an alternative. No. Uh, I, I suppose there's, a, there's the uh, quasi-alternative of embracing a system that tells you that that's not the case, that you can have complete knowledge. Uh, and, and certainly, there are, if you want to go down that road, there are plenty of systems out there waiting for you. There's, there are plenty of people prepared to tell you that they have all the answers, and they can take care of you, and they can provide you with absolute assurance and certainty. To me, that's a false comfort, because I don't believe it. And in fact, I find, and, and maybe I'm just wired weird, I don't know, um, but I find that the idea that we don't really have all the answers, to me, is a very exciting one, and, and mm. perversely, almost a kind of comforting one. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I want to know, and I, I can't quite imagine what it would be like to just sort of have everything exactly right. I, I actually think that is literally beyond the imagining of being human. I don't think we would be human. Yeah. And so for me, I'm fairly content in our state of, of kind of curiously stumbling forward and doing the best with what we find. Yeah. So is everyone who thinks they're right deluded? Well, I mean, in the sense that we're all somewhat deluded, yes. I think, I think we all, I certainly, heaven knows I think I'm right a lot of the time about a lot of things. Um, and, and most of my immediate family members disagree. <laughs> um, deluded is kind of a funny word. Um, I almost sometimes I think deluded means possessing a mind <laughs> because I'm not sure that we can have the capacity to think as creatively and cleverly and extensively as we do. And one of the things the human mind does is kind of constantly generate ideas and beliefs about the world. I'm not sure we can have that capacity and not also be somewhat deluded in the sense that we don't have all the answers but we do kind of make up all the answers. Yeah. So there's always this kind of level of delusion that's almost built into the system. We use the word as if it's a little bit pathological or a little bit negative, and obviously there's a point at which delusions become problematic. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the kind of day-to-day -day illusions that we all have and that sustain us, or that we can't avoid having because our minds are limited and the universe is infinitely complex, uh, yeah, we're all deluded. Yeah, good. <laughs> Do you feel better or worse yeah, now? <laughs> much worse, thank you. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, just one more from me and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it out. I mean, we're here in the Royal Society of Arts, and you talked a bit about art and science towards the end there, and about enlightenment, and enlightenment is a kind of scientific project of dispersing the shadows of ignorance and, and all the rest of it. And again, just to put uh, probably too false a polarity in front of you between art and science, but you, know, you could infer from what you said that 
science is all about the quest for certainty, and so to that extent it's the less mature pursuit than the arts, which in a sense embrace error and are about the celebration of error and errancy and deviation from the norm and so on. I mean, is that, uh, would that be a false thing to draw from what you're saying? You know, I have to say that when I, when I went into this project, I kind of expected to come down in that place. Yeah. Uh, to imagine, I think in my head I was sort of toying with this analogy between science and religion, actually, that in, in various ways they both believe in an absolute truth and they believe that they are the domain that possesses the tools and the methodology to arrive at that truth. Yeah. I kind of thought that was the road I was going down. And then a lot of scientists just actually showed me that I was completely wrong. I think mm. we do an injustice to science to imagine that it is an immature art, that somehow scientists are engaged in a quest for truth and are therefore more deluded than artists who have ostensibly given up the notion of truth. For starters, I think it's problematic to entirely abandon the notion of truth, and, and we all owe a lot to the scientists who you know, believe enough in the material world to give us things like penicillin and so forth. But more substantively, every, every serious scientist I've ever talked to is completely blunt about the limits of science. Mm. They have no illusion that they're chasing a grand truth. They, and, and in fact, less and less so in a way as physics moves into uh, you know, this, this very quantum physics realm, as, uh, as uncertainty occupies a more and more and more and more quantified and understood and thought about and theorized part of science, scientists are very humble in the yeah. face of, of, quote, truth, at least as much so as artists. Yeah. 